Hey, Joe, this week I'm going to talk to you about chapter two of George Kuros' book, The Innovator's Mindset. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode going through the book. I know I really enjoyed making it. And the book's 14 chapters long, so it should be just about perfect to get us through the summer and ready for next school year. Now, our official Seesaw book study class hasn't started yet, but I'm super excited to do that this week. Now, there are two quotes that jumped out at me from this chapter that I'll be discussing to start off the blog. And then the chapter ended up with five critical questions for innovative educators. And so I'll be running through those at the end of the vlog. Quote number one, the world only cares about what you can do with what you know, and it doesn't care how you learned it. This quote really hit close to home for me because my first few years teaching, I really struggled with, should I be using innovative strategies with my students? Because I knew that as they took upper level science classes, or even when they got to college and were with college professors, that they probably will not be learning using those strategies. And so I kind of use that as an excuse to be lazy. My concern was, am I setting my students up for future failure? Are they gonna be so dependent on my strategies and activities and videos that once they get into like an old school lecture style class that they won't be able to learn and they'll struggle because they're so dependent on that kind of stuff. Um, but there are two things that uh, really helped me get over that. Uh, the first one is, is if I'm teaching them skills they're gonna use later in life, they can be applied outside of school. So if they're learning how to gain understanding from YouTube videos or how to research on the internet or uh, what they do to learn best, those are skills that they can use uh, no matter how bad their future teachers are, or how boring they are in class. And the second thing that helped me out uh, talking with Craig Badura is if I can teach my students how to learn, then they can learn no matter what their teachers are like. And so those are two things that really helped me get over that. Kind of reminded me of a quote from Kayla Delzer, who is at Top Dog Teaching on Instagram. And her quote was, teachers can never base what happens in our classroom this year on what next year's teachers may or may not do. If it's best practice for our kids, do it now. It doesn't matter what's gonna happen in the future. If we think it's best, we should be doing it. If it's best for my students now, then it's best, period. The second quote from the book is, when I first started teaching, I remember thinking that students should learn how, the way I taught, they should adjust to me. And this is exactly what I thought my first year teaching, that if students aren't focused or they're not engaged, with my lessons, then it's the student's fault for being like bad people. Uh, and I had a good lesson, so it's not my fault at all. And I've had like a complete 180 from that kind of thinking where if a lesson fails for any reason, I'm the adult in the classroom. It is my responsibility. It falls on me. Let me give you a quick example. Um, I was teaching this lesson on nutrient cycles and I knew that it was going to be a lot of content to get through. So I'm like, what's the fastest way? Oh, I'll just give a quick lecture over it. And it ended up being the day after prom. And so students were really unfocused and super tired. And I'm up there going through this lecture and I can see my students struggling. And it's like the easy way out is just to blame them and be like, oh, these bad students. But it's like, it is my responsibility for having a poor lesson. I knew they were going to be tired. I knew they were going to be distracted. Why didn't I come up with a better way to engage them? It doesn't make any sense to blame the students in that situation. All right, let's go through the five critical questions for innovative educator. Question number one, would I want to be a learner in my classroom? Now this one I have to tweak a little bit because I'm so passionate about the science that I think I could learn it pretty much anyway. Um, so I have to look at it as like, if I weren't so passionate about science, would I want to be a student in my classroom? And I think about a lot of the activities that I do and I'd be like, yeah, that would be fun to do. But what I like to try to ignore are those one or two days a week where we don't have the activities and it is a little bit more boring. What can I do next year to fix those days? Question number two. What is best for this student? So instead of thinking about what's easiest or what's best for the average student, uh, I like to think about the students that I have in conceptual biology, which is a class specially for lower level students who really struggle to learn science. And so I find when I'm planning lessons for that group of students and I'm trying to think of activities that I'll be engaging and things that'll make the learning easier for them, I find that a lot of things I come up with are things that I should do for everybody anyway. So a lot of times I'll think, oh, this will be great for conceptual biology, and I plan it, and then I end up doing it for every class, 
because it'll help the people who don't struggle as well. The third question, what is this student's passion? Uh, I kind of find it hard to have students do stuff they're passionate about in my class because I feel like there's so many standards that I have to get through um, that sometimes I use that as an excuse not to do things that match my students' passions. Um, but one thing I did last year is we were talking about adaptations and I had them think of three different types of adaptations that an animal has. I let them do it over their favorite animal. And I was absolutely blown away by how many like details were added or how many facts that they knew about these things because I finally gave them a chance to talk about something they were passionate about, their favorite animal from when they were little. Question number four, what are some ways to make a true learning community? I think the best way is to do peer teaching. Uh, I know it's an easy mindset to have where it's like the teacher's the expert and the students need to just sit and get from the expert or even worse, it's like teacher versus students and teacher's gonna fight the students to get what they want and the students are gonna fight the teacher to get what they want. I think a way to kind of solve all those problems is to look at it as we're all in this together, what can we do to help each other learn the material? Um, and so that's what I try to do with some of my lessons. The fifth question is how did this work for my students talking about feedback? What I've done in the past is either super informal feedback, like how did this activity go? What'd you guys think of this? Was this lame? Um, or at the end of the year, um, having some feedback when it's kind of too late to do anything about it. So what I'm going to do next year is I think every Friday for our warm up, having them uh, do some feedback for me um, in their reflective journals, maybe what was best, what was something that they didn't really like, or some suggestions for improvement. So that way, if a student is struggling, I can fix it then instead of waiting till the end of the year when it's too late to do anything about it. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Educating Joe. Feel free to like, share, comment, or subscribe. And to all the other Educating Joes out there, have a great week.